we give God praise for the opportunity just to be here one more time in the house of worship. I leaned over uh, to Dr. Braxton as Carissa was introducing me and I said to him, you didn't teach Carissa that she who holds the mic last wins? And so I'm gonna give her grace for the tad bit of shadiness that showed up in that introduction. I'm gonna give her grace because that's what Spelman women do. Be gracious unto you. And be that the Lord would bless you. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up one more time for this awesome uh, praise team that is behind me. Whose is this? Whose is this? Is it clean? All right, I don't want to accidentally start wiping my face with something, you know, it's like, Pastor left that up there from last week. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I just want to make sure before I start touching stuff up here. Amen. It is good to be here, New Beginnings. Hey, y'all. Uh, it is certainly good just to be here with you all one more time to have the opportunity to break the bread of life uh, with you all. We're going to jump to it. I did uh, secure how much time I have from the good pastor, uh, but I want to use all my time on the word of God. And so we're going to hurry up and get to it. I guess the people in Brooklyn bring y'all greetings. Ain't that what normally what the pastors say? Uh, I'm lying because they don't know I'm here because I'd be scared to tag myself and stuff, letting them know I'm not going to be there on Sunday because they, they might not come. You know how Negroes are. Amen. I'm just glad y'all showed up today. I just, they like they posted my picture everywhere. I said, Lord, I don't know if they're gonna come tomorrow. They're like they bringing this little yellow girl back again. Any man. There's a word from the Lord on today. It comes from Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, starting at verse one, and I'm going to read down to verse 14. And you all are gonna act like that's not a lot of Bible because you didn't read nothing yesterday. Amen. Exodus chapter 32, starting at verse one, and it reads thusly. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold and a cast, an image of a calf. They said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way I have commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own sin self saying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster he planned to bring on his people. Amen. The word of the Lord is already blessed. You may be seated in his presence. For a little while this morning, I like to preach to you all from a sermon entitled, Wait a Little While Longer. Wait a Little While Longer. Pray with me, if you will. Gracious and mighty God, we love you and we adore you. 
We thank you, Father, for who you are and just for the privilege and the opportunity to be in this, your house of worship one more time. We ask God that right now in this moment, you would just tabernacle, tabernacle here with us a little while longer, that you would blow through here by the wind of your spirit, doing whatever it is you want to do, change, heal, and deliver. Open up our hearts and our minds that we receive whatever it is you have for us right now in this moment. Search us, God, and find us to be fertile ground, that your word would be planted deep within us, that we would bear much fruit in due season. And now, God, in this moment, my prayer is simple, and it is this, that you would make me small, that you would make me small so that your word might stand up tall within me, that your people might hear a word from you on high. And in the end, I'll be ever so careful to give you all the glory and the honor and say that Jesus did it, for it is in your mighty and matchless name we do pray. Amen. Wait a little while longer. Aaron is crazy as all outside. Yeah, that, that's exactly how I want to start off this sermon. I want you all to understand exactly what we're working with when we get to this 32nd chapter of Exodus. We're working with Aaron, who is clearly crazier than anybody you know. Here's the reason, people of God, that I would say to you all that Aaron is good and crazy. The Bible says that when Moses was up on the mountain communing with God, the people of Israel go to Aaron, the number two, Aaron, who Moses intentionally left behind so that he might watch over the people of Israel so that he might settle disputes between them so that if a problem arose, Aaron could handle it. Aaron is a bad babysitter, y'all. You left him in charge of your children and when you came back, your kids have a drug habit. Aaron is a bad babysitter. He's crazy as all outside. It says that the people of God, the children of Israel, they go to Aaron while Moses is up on the mountain communing with God. This part is important. I'm gonna say it over and over again because I need y'all to catch, catch it. The people of Israel go to Aaron while Moses is up on the mountain communing with God on their behalf and they say, Say to Aaron, we don't know what's coming to this man, uh, Moses, you know, the one that led us up out of Egypt, but what we need you to do is make a God for us. Got a couple of problems here. Want to lay out what I see for you all in this text. Is that okay? Problem number one. These are the same people that God just delivered from Egypt. Okay, no, because I, I still, y'all, y'all, now I'm clear y'all go to church. That was good. That was a churchy response. But what I need is a show enough you understand what was going on in Egypt kind of response. These are the same people who were in slavery in Egypt, making brick without straw from can't see to can't see. These are the same people that were being beat in the fields, murdered at any time. Come on, does it sound familiar in the streets? That they were being oppressed because of who they were, because of their heritage, because they were foreigners in the land of Egypt and in that moment God saw their oppression and heard their cries and he sent Moses to set them free and in the midst of all of what happened to gain their freedom God didn't just say to uh, uh, Moses go on and tell Pharaoh let my people go and Pharaoh said you know what cool that sounds like a plan no 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 God told Moses go to Pharaoh say let my people go Moses did what God told him to do Pharaoh looked Moses dead in his face and said nah chill son Moses goes back to God, says, I told him what you told me to tell him. And he said, nah, chill, son. God said, he said that? He said, yo, he said that. He said, okay, cool. Check it out. Here's what's about to happen. Plagues, homie. Plagues. Let's see what goes down. See how he wants to behave after the plagues come. And so he doesn't just send one plague. He sends a whole bunch of plagues. At first, Pharaoh don't care that the water turned into blood. We like bloody water. That's, that's cool with him. But, but here's the thing. The Bible says after the bloody water, then he sent frogs. The people didn't care about frogs being all over their cars and all over their houses and all in the carport when they pulled in from work. They didn't care nothing about that. And so after another plague, gnats. Y'all know what happens right after gnats come? After gnats, then come the flies. After the flies, then come the livestock, all kind of diseases and stuff. They didn't care nothing about the cows falling out, mad cow disease everywhere, people dying 
lying, acting crazy. They ain't care nothing about that. And so he said, you know what? Maybe they'll react when it begins to touch their skin. And so then he sends boils on them and then thunder and hail. They don't have hail in Egypt. Ain't no snow in Egypt. This is, an, uh, this is some new stuff God is doing in this land. They still don't care. They're still not scared. And so then he sends the locusts, and the locusts eat up everything and tear up the fields and tear up everything that they have to eat, and the produce is destroyed. And still Pharaoh is like, nope, my slaves, who going to make the sandwiches? We going to keep them. <laughs> God says, you know what? cool, we're going to show them we ain't playing with them. It, you all know the last one, the final plague is the one where uh, the death angel comes and touches over every house except for the children of Israel because they had the lamb's blood splattered across the door. You all are familiar with this. I could tell y'all a, a, a Bible church here. But right after that, what ends up happening is that uh, uh, Pharaoh wakes up and his own son is dead as the grief can be heard echoing throughout Egypt. Then Pharaoh says, yo, get your people and and get up out of here to Moses. And Moses said, you ain't said nothing but a word. Mount up. He looks at Pharaoh and says, sir, would you mind if we take a few things with us? He said, take everything you want to take. They had everything that the Egyptians had on their backs, on the donkeys, gold. They done stole the people's flower pots. They took the people's mic stands and had them carrying them up out of Egypt. But then what happened was, uh, come on here. They were on their way, making their way to freedom. This is what happens. They're, they're on their way to freedom. It's a big congregation. It ain't just us and the praise team. Everybody, you ever seen a nation try to escape? A nation trying to escape. They making it look like the Labor Day Parade in Brooklyn. They all pressing their way. They got all kind of stuff and donkeys and it's piled up. Hakeem, your mama calling for you in the front. They, but, but then Pharaoh wakes up. Come on here. Look, let, let it live for you. Then Pharaoh wakes up and he's hungry. He calls Martha. Martha, Martha, Martha don't answer. He said, where in the heck is Martha? They come, they say, well, Pharaoh, you know, Martha was one of them uh, Israelites. They left. He said, well, well, tell Mary to go in there and make me a sandwich. They said, well, you know, that's the problem, sir. Uh, Mary, she an Israelite. So he said, well, who gonna make the sandwiches? <laughs> and they said, I, don't, I would make one, but I've never done that before. He said, well, we can't live like this. He told all the army of Egypt to get up and mount up so they could run after the Israelites. All of this started over a sandwich. In my mind. In my mind. And so they chase after the Israelites. They think they're gaining on them, but right as they get to the water, uh, the, you can imagine it, that the Egyptians are like, sure, they are running towards the water. These are full Negroes right here. They don't even know where they're running towards. But they get there. Y'all know the story. Moses raises up the staff, splits the uh, Red Sea. They walk across on dry ground. The Israelites, the Israelites see it. They walk across. They all like, come on, hurry up. We don't know how long this water going to stay, how long is going to get tired. Uh, the Egyptians see See it, they're like, yo, never seen, you ever seen something like, I've never seen nothing like this in my whole life. Yo, this is dope, come on, y'all. They all get in the water too. They rushing across on dry ground. They think they're gonna make it right as the last uh, Israelite put their foot on the ground on the other side. Most said, man, I'm tired. Put his hands down, the water rushed all of them. It says that they all die. Here's the thing. These are the same children of Israel that witnessed the glory of God on their behalf. That, that the, the, they're not new to God. God's already been working for them and delivering for them and uh, helping them out of uh, tough jams and opening doors and making ways and preserving their life. And yet in the midst of it, because Moses, their leader, is on a mountain talking to God, communing with God on their behalf, they go to Aaron and say, make for us a God. It, it's problematic, I would say, but Aaron... No, 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 sir. Aaron is crazy. If I was in Brooklyn, I would tell y'all how crazy he is. Aaron is crazy as all outside. This man don't got the good sense that God gave him. What you talking about, Reverend? Because here's the thing. The rest of the people have seen God work on their behalf, but Aaron has seen God. 
You see, the Bible says a couple of chapters earlier, if you go back to Exodus chapter 24, that Aaron was amongst the few, the 70 plus uh, three more plus Moses. They got to go up a little bit higher onto the actual mountain. They got to see God. They didn't get to touch God. They didn't get to come face to face with him with the same level of intimacy that Moses did. But the Bible says in chapter 24 that they went up the mountain, that they saw God. He saw God. He, he could see the ground that God was standing on, says that it looked like clear sapphire, like it was the ground of heaven beneath him. And in the midst of it, it doesn't say that it was a brief, like, oh, open and close kind of thing. It wasn't a peekaboo situation. No, they sat down and they ate and drank in the presence of God. How is it that you could see God and yet somebody else could come before you and say, make for us a God and your response would be like, bring me to jury. But... And so Aaron doesn't say, no, you already have a God. And Aaron doesn't say, uh, uh, no, no, because clearly y'all are tripping, y'all are bugging out, you are being sinful, what you're doing is perverse, what you're asking for is ludicrous. No, what Aaron says is, bring me the jewelry. Aaron ain't the only crazy one amongst us. Because the truth of the matter is that some of us are just like Aaron and just like the children of Israel, that God has done all kind of amazing things on your behalf, opened up doors that you thought were sealed shut, created windows where there were no windows, made an opportunity where opportunities could not present themselves, put you in schools that you know good and well, you did not have the grades, GPA, or aptitude to get into, and then somehow ushered you through all the matriculation process, didn't let you just get accepted, but let you finish, let you graduate. Somehow you got an honor course put around your neck though you've been dishonorable your whole entire life and yet in the midst of it somehow when the rubber hits the road and life gets difficult again you find yourself searching for God and something else but but I think that in the end what what we learn from Aaron and the children of Israel is just to wait a little while longer that the problem right here is that they don't want to wait for Moses to come down from the mountain it's not that they don't believe that if Moses comes down, God won't be available to them. It's not even as if they have said, well, since Moses has been on the mountaintop, God has gotten distracted and stopped providing. That, that's not even the accusation here. The, the accusation is simply, we don't know what's come of Moses, and so make for us a God. Uh, I really need to play this out for you. It says that Aaron then says to them, bring me the jewelry. There's no hesitation. I, I need to take this off. I want to take this off. That's cool with y'all. Okay, here we go. Hold on. It, it says that Aaron, I got it. We good. We good, Derek. It says that Aaron doesn't hesitate. He simply says to them, uh, bring your jewelry. Your wife jewelry, your son jewelry, your daughter jewelry. Aaron creates a mold. Aaron creates a mold of a calf out of gold, looks at it in his mind. Ooh, it's good. Ooh, that's pretty. Look how it's shining. It's glistening, ain't it? All right, come on here. Now we're going to build an altar. Aaron decides what he wants God to look like. Oh, oh, come here. Let me come get you. Uh, some of us right now in your mind, this seems like a foreign idea or concept because you ain't never melted down a piece of jewelry in your whole life. Bless you. Uh, but the reality is that many of us are just like Aaron creating custom gods that you take what you want to take and leave what you want to leave. And so in the end, yes, you want the God that says I'm the head and not the tail above and not beneath a lender and not a borrower. But we do not want the God that says uh, all the world should live holy before me. We do not want the God that says you should live righteously or you should live holy or forgive your neighbor or to treat the foreigner well. No, what we want to do is pick and choose a designer God that fits our particular needs and proclivities. You see, because in your Bible, God says it's okay to every now and then get so. Oh, that's the later service. That's, that's not y'all. Y'all still living holy. Amen. That's not, oh, I'm coming for them later though. And, and, and so here we go, the, the danger, 
that we learn about is that in the midst of waiting, if we do not wait well, you will ultimately end up creating miniature gods for yourselves. W what is it that you're talking about, Reverend? Because I don't have no small statues in my house. Uh, ultimately, uh, whatever is your ultimate concern, Paul Tillich says, that is your God. And so for some of us, the truth of the matter is parents are the most sinful among us because we turn our children into gods. They can't do a nan thing for us. These toddlers, these uh, elementary school people, these junior high school, the expensive high school ungrateful ones. Come on, bless y'all. I see y'all in here. Uh, is Y'all cute as a mug. But ultimately, we are the sinful parents allowing these children to become our ultimate concern. You wake up in the morning thinking about them and go to sleep at night thinking about them. And the truth of the matter is all they're thinking about is Paw Patrol, Teletubbies and Jordans, but here you are designing your entire life around them. Sinful. Oh, oh, look how quiet the parents got. It's a... but, but it goes on and it says, uh, the real danger is that after they create the God, then they ascribe to God, to this calf, the wins and the successes that are God's. Because right after, afterwards, Aaron gets real crazy. It says that after he creates the golden calf, he brings it before them, he takes it, and then he says, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. How, Sway? How? How, how is the calf the thing that brought us up out of Egypt when we just saw you create it right here in front of us? And this seems like a foreign thing, but here's the deal. We do this all the time, that God does things for us. And in the end, after it works out, after we've benefited, after we've won, after we've gotten the victory, after things have been our way, after we found a man, lost the weight, got the job, got accepted, got the mortgage, got our child out of jail, after everything works out in our favor, then all of a sudden, somehow, somebody else gets the credit oh well the church prayed and ter no 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 I'm, I'm glad they prayed but that was God oh well you know I, I did I did my best work for them that's why I got that promotion no 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 you did do your best work but you late every single day of the week and you still copies Shaniqua and so we know that it belongs to God. All the glory, all the credit, all the honor belongs to God. And so what ends up happening is that sometimes we trick ourselves into thinking that the glory in the Shaniqua don't, Shaniqua don't steal copies. Uh, it, but, but here, it, it gets even more problematic because then he says tomorrow we'll have a festival. We're gonna have a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up in revel. That they are now celebrating and honoring this golden calf. Have you ever, come on if we would be honest in the house of the Lord today, have you ever reveled in your sin? C celebrated the fact that you knew you were outside of the will of God. Come on here, just anybody here who's ever been to homecoming tailgate knows the answer is yes. Just, just like to revel in it a little, just like to revel in it. Just red cups all around, happy, drunk, stumbling, throwing up in front of people, reveling in it. It, it says that it, they do this, but here's where it gets good to me. It says the Lord looks at Moses. They, their time is not even done. And so the next thing that this, that this scripture teaches us about uh, waiting a little while longer is that when you don't wait properly, uh, your impatience impacts other people's relationship with God. What, what you mean? Your, your, your impatience impacts other people's relationship with God. What you talking about, Reverend? Right there. It's right there in the text. I'm not making it up. Verse 7 says, the Lord said to Moses, go down at once. Your people. God don't even want to claim them no more. Yo people who you brought up out of the land of Egypt, because at this point, if it was up to me, them Negroes would still be slaving away. They have been quick to turn aside from what I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshiped and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, oh, and, uh, here's the thing, go down at once. He wasn't done with God. 
Their time together was not done. The sweet ambiance of fellowship was not done. Can't you smell the praise and the worship and the, the, the lingering, the tarrying? Some of us don't get it because we don't tarry in the Lord anymore. But how he was just laying prostrate before the Lord in his very presence, how he could look down and see the feet of God and just tears weeping from his eyes because he knew that he was in the presence of the one who had saved his life, who had given him a new lease on life, who had done everything for him that he could not do himself, but because of the sins of the people, he had to go down at once. Here's what I would say to you. There are people watching you that you don't know are watching you. And how you wait impacts them. I have a three-year-old grandson. He's awesome and amazing. Chase Lorenzo. Shout out to Chase. Uh, Chase, when we are in the car, I realize uh, quicker than I realized initially, but everything I do in the car, he's paying attention to. He's in the car seat, in his back, uh, in the back seat, in the car seat, and uh, when I am driving and on my New York road rage tip, this boy is picking up every habit that I've ever had. And so sometimes when the light turns green and the car in front of me doesn't move, I start going, yo fam, green means go. Yeah, like just in the car, like I'm not rolling down the window, cussing folks out. I drive with my windows rolled up because I have road rage and I don't want to accidentally cuss out my members. You know, like I don't want to accidentally, it'd be one of them. And so, uh, but every time, if I'm frustrated, if we're rushing to get somewhere, as soon as the light turns green, I want the person in front of me to drive. If they don't drive, yo, bro, green means go. A couple of weeks ago, I'm walking with Chase Lorenzo. We're not in the car, we're walking. There are other people in front of us. Uh, the traffic signal for the walk turns green. Uh, we are behind like three sets of people. People are talking, they're not paying attention. The guy directly in front of us is on his cell phone. The first group, late, but they start walking. The next guy doesn't start walking. Chase starts walking, almost bumps into him. Real, I grab his hand, pull him back a little bit so he doesn't bump into the guy. Chase screams out, yo, bro, green means go. I couldn't do anything but bust out laughing. Uh, the gentleman turned around, he said, yo, my bad, shorty. He said, go. And I was, I was, you can't chastise somebody when you know they got it directly from you. I mean, he was, it was verbatim. I looked at him and said, we don't want to, that's, that's, come on, let's go, man. Just, just come on. It was one of those situations where in that moment, uh, uh, he knew that this person was keeping him from getting where he needed to go. And the reason why he picked up on that is because he had been watching me so alertly, so attentively. He never said to me before, Mimi, I'm listening to the things you say and eventually I'm going to say them. But guess what? He was. And likewise, there are people in your lives who are watching you, who are paying attention to you, who are listening to you, and they are watching watching you and listening to you say that you are a believer in the one and true living God. They are watching you say over and over again that you trust in God and that you walk with Jesus, that Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm chasing after him. All of these things, they've heard you over and over again. And so when crisis hits, when drama comes, when heartache comes your way, and the first thing you do is fall out and fall out and cry, and I want to die, and woe is me. How did they leave me? Why did it happen? What's going on? Oh my God, I can't believe it happened. It's like, God's not even here. He don't listen to me anymore. They're, they're watching how you respond. And, and if your response is not simply one of, this is why I love uh, the story of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I really love them because their greatest testimony is my God can, my God will. But even if he doesn't, we won't bow down. And, and I, I, I just love that because that is the heart that God really wants us to have. Not that uh, God is some bellhop that he comes when we ring the bell, when we call on him, he does our bidding. And some of us, we have turned God into a genie. We out here with Aladdin, like rubbing the Bible, like as soon as we touch it, God is going to do what we want him to do. And here's the thing, for most of us, if you got what you wanted from God, you'd be dead. 
that we're out here asking for things that we can't even handle, that the truth of the matter is here. I, I wish there were some more people here from the shift conference, but uh, some of us have been begging and waiting for things and crying about things that if God gave it to you in the season in which you wanted it, you didn't yet have the character, the integrity, the support system that you needed to manage it. And in the end, you'd be dead. You would have failed. You would have flunked out. You would have got fired. And it's not just the young people. It's all of us that we act like God saying not now is the same thing as God saying no and then we act a fool but after that God is angry he big mad oh you mad you big mad like he he's angry God tells Moses go down there he don't say go down there um, and see if you could get them to act right he's just like leave so I could do my business because what I'm about to do is murk all these Negroes. Like, I ain't got no time for none of this foolishness no more. But then Moses says to him, now this is good, check it, y'all. We're not staying here much longer. Moses says to him, it, it, the Bible says he implored the Lord. Oh, that somebody would intervene on your behalf. It, it, it says that he implored the Lord. And here's the thing. He didn't just say, no, please don't hurt him. No, don't do that. Don't, don't whoop him. I have... Uh, I have a gang of younger siblings, but uh, four younger siblings all together, uh, three left now. Uh, when they were growing up, if I knew they were about to catch it, I am eight years older than the ones right underneath me, and so there are like huge age gaps. I would literally just be like, yo, come on, Pharrell, don't do, like, come on, please don't, don't hurt them. Like, <laughs> I know he's stupid, but he's so little, like, please, I like him. I want them to live, you know, like, because my parents would be like, uh, I remember one day my stepfather said to my little brother, I'm about to stomp a mud hole in your chest. Now, my stepfather was like 6'3", 200-something pounds, and I was like, oh, no, this could happen. You know, like, sometimes the threat to be like, man, you can't, I'm going to slap the black up. You can't do that. You have not the skill or the authority to make that kind of threat. But this particular one, I said, if he continues to just stomp on this boy's chest, like, we might see the ground. Like, this really might happen. I was nervous. I said, please don't do that to him. He's so little. We know he's not smart, but he can get smarter. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just step in. But that's not, that's not what Moses does. Moses looks at God. And th this is a privilege. He's literally looking at God advocating for them. And he says, uh, don't do this because think about what the Egyptians will say about you. Some of us just need to read the Bible more. That way you, you could talk to God a certain kind of way. If you could say, but Lord, you said in your word, but, it, but in your word, you said you, in, in, your, in your word, you said that you would protect me, that you would never leave me, that you would never forsake me. In, in, in your word, you said that you would not allow my foot to, come on, they, they, you got to know the word. And so in this moment, he says, think about what, you, what the Egyptians will say about you. Think about what you said uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Think about your word and what it'll mean if this happens to your people, if you do this. And in the midst of this advocacy, the Bible simply says, and the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring upon the people. But here's the thing that I really want to point out to you, that in the midst of them waiting poorly, they dishonored God. And had there not been somebody to advocate for them, they would be dead. Ah, okay. It, it, advocacy is a huge thing because in this moment what it does is it, it speaks to God and says this person is not who they're supposed to be right now but they're also not who they could be they're not behaving in such a way right now that they're performing at their optimal level of who you created them to be. But God, I believe that if you just spare them, if you just give them a little bit more time, that maybe ultimately they'll turn into the person that you want them to behave, how you want them to be.
who you want them to become. And this is where, for me, the scripture really gets good at the point where it says, and God changed his mind about the fact that the people who had dishonored him in the midst of their waiting, that they did not have to die, that they could still be the children of Israel, that they could still be the children of God, that he would spare them and allow them to live. But here's the thing. It still came with the understanding that when they, Moses went down the mountain, that they still had to act right. Because when Moses finally goes down the mountain, he doesn't go down the mountain by himself. He goes down the mountain with the tablets. Y'all, y'all saw the movie, right? And, and so he goes down the mountain with the tablets. When he gets down the mountain with the tablets, uh, he sees what's going on. Bro gets so mad that he takes the tablets. What happens in the movie? Y'all saw Ben-Hur. He, 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 he takes the tablets and he breaks them at the base of the mountain because he's so angry. The tablets were inscribed with the Ten Commandments. The Bible says that it was written with the finger of God. That waiting poorly makes us lose things that we would otherwise have. Oh, okay. All right, here we go. Waiting poorly makes us lose things that we would otherwise have. Again, kids are great preaching fodder. It's the last one for today. We're on our way. Uh, I have two sons, uh, young adult sons. Uh, they are, uh, maybe one day they'll be who God wants them to be. I love them, you know, because they're mine, but I would punch both of them in the throat at any given time. <laughs> both of them. 21, 22, that's, that's what you do with those age. At any given time, right here. Uh, my youngest son uh, uh, was in the hospital earlier this year, and at one point we were waiting on the surgeon to come and give us some information about when he was going to have his surgery. Uh, uh, he was getting extremely impatient. Now, I understand why he was getting impatient because as he was waiting for the surgery, one of the things that happened, uh, Dr. Braxton, is that he could not eat. Uh, he already is 6'1", weighs 125 pounds, so y'all couldn't imagine what he looks like, uh, real thin anyway. And so he was like, they are starving me. Like the drama, the, the heights of the drama that this went to. He had an IV in his arm. He certainly was not going to die in the hospital. But he was like, they are starving me. I can't take it. I'm wasting away. He was telling me, I'm losing pounds as we're talking, Ma. This is horrible. Why are you? And he's like, at one point, super dramatic. He's crying. The tears are rolling down the side of his face into his ears. He's saying to me, why are you letting them do this to me? Please just bring me food. You could sneak it in. Bring me food. Ma, a nugget. I'll just eat one. It's okay. I don't need six. Just he, drama on drama on drama. I say, uh, sir, relax. Get it together. We're waiting on the doctor. If the doctor comes and says you're gonna have the surgery, then you'll be ready. If the doctor comes and says you're not gonna have the surgery, I will go and get you something to eat. Relax. Uh, the surgeon uh, is taking his time, taking his time. In the midst of this, they call me and say, we need you to come downstairs and fill out some more paperwork with the case manager. I go downstairs and the time that I go downstairs, this fool calls his girlfriend. She comes up to the hospital and gives him food. I am downstairs. As I'm getting off the elevator on my way upstairs, I meet the surgeon. I said, hey, what's up? Do we have good news? Is it going to be today? He said, we're about to go make you a very happy young man. The surgery is going to be today. That means by tomorrow, he should at least be able to take in liquids. I know he'll be happy about that. We could get him a good smoothie going. I was like, bless God. I don't have to hear this man complain one more time. The doctor starts laughing. He says, we're going to get him some relief. If the smoothie works out well, by tomorrow night, he'll be able to eat food. I said, oh, well, come on here. Let's walk faster. The doctor and I are laughing and joking and walking. And as we enter the room, I see See this fool with a bag of Subways laying on his chest, eating the sandwich. He looked happy. Oh, he looked happy. I walked in. The doctor said, tell him what I was going to tell him, and just turned around and walked out. 
He said, wait, what happened? I said, you were about to be taken into surgery, but now that you've eaten the very thing that you wanted because you could not wait, now you will not have. Come here, somebody. That in the midst of waiting poorly, what ends up happening is that we do things that we have no business doing. And so in the midst of it, the situations that God is preparing for us and setting up for us and aligning for us ultimately end up falling apart because in the midst of poor waiting, what we prove to God is ultimately we do not trust him. But, but the good news is that God still says to Moses, cool, I won't kill him. No, that really is the good news today, that in the midst of waiting poorly, that God still leaves room for improvement. And so for somebody here today, the truth is simply this, that I, I just stopped by to remind you to wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he will direct your path. Again, I say, wait on the Lord. And, and if you don't get anything else from the entire sermon, hear me when I say this, God's time will always be better than yours. That, that God's time will always be better than yours. That when you think you need something now, God is saying, I'm, I'm preparing you for it. That God's time is always better than yours. And so as we stand on our feet all around the sanctuary, I think there's somebody here today. Come on, let's give God praise today. There may be somebody here right now who's, the truth is you have been waiting on the Lord and you've been feeling discouraged in the midst of your waiting. If that's you right now, I want to just tell you that God isn't just being silent. God is working on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes the reason why we can't hear God is because God is busy working. And so if you're here and you feel like you've been waiting too long, and you feel like you've been waiting all alone because you haven't yet surrendered your life to this savior named Jesus. As I prepare to hand the mic off to Reverend Derek, we want you to simply just come forward and surrender your life to Christ today. If you're here and you have not been connected to Jesus Christ, don't wait alone. Don't feel abandoned. Just come and surrender your life to the one that walks with you throughout your life. Is there one on today as the deacons come? Yeah. 